have been charged with somehow dealing with good country people today. Um, so, uh, first of all, there are lots of things that are going on in the story. We won't take the time to talk about them um, in, you know, sort of minute literary analysis sort of way. But we're going to talk about the story, how it can help us with the um, habit of mind and the benediction value that we're working on this week. Um, the value that we're working on here is intellectual hospitality um, and uh, thinking flexibly and unthreatened engagement. So, <laughs> um, we're going to do a little bit of reading against the story for a moment. Um, we're going to take about 10 minutes and I'd like for you to pair up, uh, um, maybe the group of about three people, you know, you can move around as you need to. Um, probably three is about all you can, you can work with on this particular thing. You can have someone write, um, if you'd like, um, or if you can remember what you said, that's fine too. Uh, usually if I have students get into a group, I have to require somebody to write something because otherwise they'll all just sit there. Um, so just find yourself a group of uh, about three people, please. Move around as you need to. Okay, so this is what we're going to do, and I don't, I'm don't. i not sure whether it's going to work with this story or not. I've never used it with this story, so we'll, we'll hope it does. Um, but what I'm going to give you, walk around and give you, is a card on which is a term that is related to the story or to the reading about the habit of mind um, or the Benedictine value that we're working on in this particular unit. Um, when you get your card, I want you to talk about it with your group and define the term as it might be defined by this story. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> so what you're going to do is define the term as it might be defined by Flannery O'Connor's Good Country People. Now that means that the definition of the term may very well not be your definition of the term. And so you, you can put it in the voice of the story if you like, or you can just relate a particular event um, that seems to demonstrate the definition of that term in the story. For example, uh, let's say the term is honesty. Um, I might define the term honesty in the context of good country people as when you know a stranger comes to your house and asks you, why isn't your Bible in the parlor? And you say, well, my daughter is an atheist, and so I can't have it in the parlor, um, because that will make him feel better, and that makes me look better. I don't tell him that it's up here. Right, so that's honesty. That's honesty in the world of good country people. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So after you have worked on it together, um, we're going to share the definitions without saying what the term is. <laughs> so you're going to give your definition of honesty without actually using the word honesty. And then we will talk a little bit about whether or not we can figure out what that, how that term is in fact being defined. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Shuffling, the heart. shuffling the cards. Try not to, try not to tell all of the people around you what your, what your topic is. All right, so let's hear what you have. Um, part of what this, what this exercise also does is something that we are hoping that, that you know, our students learn how to do a little bit better. And that is listening to what someone says. Um, you're defining a term here without using the term. So you're going to have to listen to the way they described it, and explained it, in order to really be able to catch what this is possibly like. So, why don't you guys start? Okay, so we have a blank is a person who practices external decency. Okay. Oh, it's not straight. 
Say it one more time. A person who practices external Okay. A person who practices external Anybody have any ideas? Any, any thoughts about how this, can you tell us a little about how you got to that from the story? We could, but we don't want to be rude to anybody. Okay. <laughs> That wouldn't be a good question. A question. question. Is there an episode that would help us in the story? The the first encounter between um, <laughs> the salesman and Mrs. Soltan. Okay. <laughs> Doctor, why are they talking behind me? It's disturbing. Oh, we're nominating. They're not. They're not. You know what? Christian. <laughs> uh, oh, good job. Oh, you're an English teacher. You know this already. <laughs> now, so yes, yeah, so you're you. Yeah. Well, I just said Christian. Christian. Good Christian. Your term is good Christian. Yes. Good okay. Christian. So Julie got it. Why? Why is this? <laughs> why does this definition seem to come out of that story? External decency. I think it was because of the way the salesman presents himself, um, and then in the end, of course, as as he tells it, just because I sell this crap doesn't mean I believe it. So. Okay. So all you have to do is present yourself is well, and people will buy. It. Present yourself well, and you are a good crustian, right? Um, it doesn't. It, this is not about a depth of belief or a depth of idea or depth of concept. It's about politeness. It also picks up the, the symbolism of trust because it's just <laughs> external. Exactly, exactly. Okay, you guys back there. What's your definition? <laughs> uh, our definition is this is what you have when you uh, recognize another good country person and invite them into your home for a meal because they are a good country person. This thing is what you have. Yes. Mm -hmm. For our practice. Okay. Oops. Can you give us an episode in the story that seems to reflect that? Um, so when Manly Pointer arrives and is invited to come and stay for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that really takes it farther. <laughs> Happy to help. Are you being hospitable? Nope. Um, okay. uh, hospitality. This is a harder one. Hospitality. Hospitality. Decency? Well, what did you say? Hospitality. Decency? 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 Politeness? Insight. Say it. Insight. 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 Why insight? Because you can recognize the good country people. Oh, uh, okay. okay. So you say you see, you can see them. You can, you know them. They are, they are one of you. You are one of them. Correct. <coughs> we all know each other. <laughs> We're all cousins. <laughs> That's right. But the thing is, are the people in the story good country people? And how are you going to recognize them? What's the What's the key that you have to have in order to recognize them? What do you have to know about them? Where they're from. Where they're from. Okay. So it's not just good country people, is it? Mm, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> you want to help us out a little bit more? Give, can you help yeah, us out with a little bit more me. definition? Um. <clears throat> But you might also ask like about their beliefs and about like um, like why why is there no like you know talk about the Bible and you know like, why is it not out you know so that might be a part of this kind of welcoming them in. Okay, so you're inviting them in. You ask about their beliefs, heritage, or tradition. 
Now do your tradition? Um, we were halfway there earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but there's Part like another there. half we have to kind of cover. Your suddenness is getting <laughs> <laughs> Does this is this term define? Um, are we defining this term kind of in opposition? This is not what we would how we would define. It is this an term. open question whether or not the people in this any of the people in the story truly, oh, in fact, exemplify this concept. But to them, it would look yeah, white trash hospitality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so and it's a kind of that thing charity. Charity, Charity hospitality, hospitality, empathy, empathy. Uh, uh, compassion. compassion. No, no, don't walk away from oh. what Josh said. Am I allowed to say? Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, so is hospitality of a certain kind? No. Benedictine? No. Intellectual. <laughs> intellectual. Oh, intellectual hospitality. Oh, yeah. I see. It. <laughs> it was all our I'm feeling a little worried about this picture. It's having the Heidegger book in your house. Instead of a Bible. Can't tell someone. A this, of course, this is one of our key, key terms here, but um, what is, what, for us, what is intellectual hospitality? For us. Assuming that we... Is openness to hearing something that I don't already think mm -hmm. and sticking with it long enough to understand what's meant. Okay. And do any of the people in this story do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a hard question. <laughs> it's not a hard question at all. No, because they all know it right away. They know it before they are Getting any evidence. Right. I mean, from, it, um, from, if you'll excuse the expression, from educational bottom to educational top in this story, um, Mrs. Hopewell and Mrs. Freeman, as well as Joy Holga, who, you know, these, has reached the pinnacle of educational um, instruction, none of them engage in this, right? What is it that Joy Holga is trying to do? with Manly Pointer. You can start talking about these names if you wanted to in this discussion, but... <laughs> <laughs> what is it that she wants to do when she goes running off into the, into the uh, hayloft with Manly Pointer? We know one thing she wants to do, but what's the other thing that she wants to do? Mm -hmm. But she wants, she wants to show him he's wrong. Yeah. Right. She wants to show him how smart she is. How, you know, she's gonna, she's gonna, she's bought, of course, she's bought his line, right, that he's a good Christian. Um, he's a Bible salesman. Um, so, of course, she's, act, she's acting under a misapprehension. She doesn't actually see um, who he actually is. But her, her goal is to make a fool of him. Bully him. To bully him, to intellectually bully him, because she thinks he's stupid, right? Um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go on to another term. They guys. all think he's stupid. They all think he's stupid. Yes, for one reason or another. Right. Yeah, but they also, Mrs. Freeman and Mrs. Hopewell, of course, think Joy Holga is stupid, because, she, and so they are also engaged in intellectual, in intellectual inhospitality, right? You guys back there. All right, so we have two quotes from the story and then a further definition. But the quotes are, everybody is different. It takes all kinds to make the world. Uh-huh. I never use cliches. I've said that myself. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh-huh. And then, it, it, I guess you'd say, in practice, it comes out as never be rude and practice hospitality at all. Never be rude, practice hospitality at all. It takes... And then uh, everybody is different. It takes all kinds to make the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean intellectual hospitality here. <laughs> no. We said hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> so an episode that helps us understand that other than the quotations from Mrs. Freeman. That's it. Uh, Ms. Sokol, sorry. Ms. Sokol. Uh, um, I 
think there's some acceptance, maybe, of uh, this is just how, for example, the daughters are, Mrs. Freeman's daughters are. This is, uh, yeah, I, think, I don't remember exactly how she described them, but she describes them and then says, but that's how they are. Openness? Um, I, that's not the word, but it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's close. It's close. It's close. It's close. Tolerance. Yeah. 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 Tolerance. Um, and what is the nature of Mrs. Hopewell and Mrs. Freeman's tolerance of Joy Helga? Well, they're not talking yeah. to Joy Helga. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are. Um, they allow her to exist. They're tolerant of each other, but they are they are up to a point tolerant of each other. Although, of course, Mrs. Hopewell engages in considerable amount of um, intolerance towards Mrs. Freeman in her mind. Right. Um, but yeah, they don't uh, they are not tolerant of her in in yeah. As, as long as their tolerance is passive aggressive, right? Externally decent. It's externally okay. decent. Yes. Yes. So this is if, if this is toler in this story, tolerance is the 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 lowest common denominator. Don't be rude. Right? How about you guys? Truthful, simple, direct, <laughs> not trash, and salt of the earth. Ooh. Good country. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the title of the book. <laughs> Truthful, simple, direct, salt of the earth. Now, how are those terms ironic in this story? Man, he's not simple. He isn't. No, oh, nor is he direct. And none of them are really salt of the earth. And none of them are really salt of the earth. And none of them are salt of the earth, yeah. This isn't salt of earth supposed to be the thing that adds flavor, and it, in a sense, it goes against the grain. Yes. So that's kind of the opposite of. Yes, although I mean the term is also used to mean you know you are you are the the very essence the, the lies of the world. You have to deal with something like that. I have a question whether whether Mrs. Hopewell would see herself as good country people because I thought it was almost a class distinction for her. It was like a euphemism oh, yeah. for redneck. Yes. True. Oh yeah. Yes, I think so. Um, it's important to remember that when Manny Pointer comes to the door. Um, she is barely tolerant. You know, she doesn't want him to come in. She, you know, she says, "Well, okay, fine, you can come in for a minute, but I'm cooking my dinner." Um, when he asks her about her Bible and where it is, of course, she's a little embarrassed about that. But she says, "I've got to go into the kitchen. I've got to, I've got to, you know, you go away. But the dinner's burning. Go away, right?" Um, it isn't until he, and of course, this is where, as readers, here's a moment of literary analysis. Um, as readers, we can see pretty clearly, I think, if you're pretty astute readers, you can see almost immediately Manny Pointer is pulling a fast one. Because he listens to what she says, mm -hmm. and he changes his demeanor. He changes who he is. He changes how he presents himself. You know. Um, so uh, she gets up and she says, I don't want to buy a Bible. I smell my dinner burning. He didn't get up. He began to twist his hands and looking down at them, he said softly, well, lady, I'll tell you the truth. Not many people want to buy one nowadays. And besides, I know I'm real simple. I don't know how to say a thing, but to say it, I'm just a country boy. He glanced up into her unfriendly face. People like you don't like to fool with country people. He has read her, right? Yes. right? He's a salesman. Right? But he's practicing, he's also practicing the art of listening. Not for good. You go that. Oh, I'll give the example when she asks it. <laughs> this is reluctantly and with false politeness inviting a stranger into your home. Reluctantly. And with false politeness. Okay. Inviting a stranger into your home. 
courtesy. Hospitality. hospitality. <laughs> yeah, hospitality. Ding, ding, ding. Hospitality, hospitality, as opposed to the intellectual hospitality. Right. Just, just garden. There's a garden variety hospitality. Um, Nothing intellectual about it. <laughs> um, and that is okay, right? I mean, all she has to get is kind of the bare minimum of politeness. Uh, people of the lower class who ignore and or flaunt well defined social customs. People of a lower class who ignore and or flaunt so, so yes. social customs. Trash. Trash. <laughs> Trash. Right. Um, now, a couple of these that I didn't hand out to you, but you can, you can, we can talk about them a little bit. Um, self-sacrifice. There's a lot of self-sacrifice in this story. I love that voice. <laughs> self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. Who engages in self-sacrifice? Uh, Mrs. Hopewell engages in self-sacrifice when she hires Freeman. Isn't it true? On this, like, you know, broken person who, you know, previous employer really had nasty things to say about. You know, she, she's the salt here. Um, and Mrs. Hopewell, you know, she... She's nice enough to let her do everything. She's nice enough to let her do everything, but it is a sacrifice. Um, nothing is perfect. Especially not you. <laughs> Who else does some self-sacrificing here? Joy. Joy. Oh she could be gosh. teaching at a university. She could be teaching at a university. She could be, you know, writing grand and glorious articles for journals that no one would read. She could be, you know, engaging in intellectual conversation. What is she doing? She's here, taking care of her mother, being a good daughter. Um, another one that I, that I didn't, that I had to, for you to think about was also inherent dignity. And that's one of the things that we're thinking a little bit about. How would some of these characters define the term inherent dignity? Or how does the story seem to have defined inherent dignity? Ancestral wealth, there's one. Okay, ancestral wealth. Again, kind of the right. sort of played back into the class distinction. Trash. Good country people versus trash. Inherent dignity. Is there anyone who engages your, or who, um, no. is there anyone who um, acts upon that term as we would hope they would? How would we define someone's inherent dignity or how one ought to act? Irrespective of the story. A, a worthiness that comes from what you are rather than how you act. Okay, a worthiness that comes from what you are in, and what you are is what? As a human, as, as a, a person. As a person, right. as a human being, okay. So you could, you know, rob a bank, but you still deserve a certain amount of inherent dignity because of your humanity, okay. How about that definition? Does that definition apply in this story? Is anybody engaged in, in the interaction with people with that definition? Well, I, I see that that everybody sizes everybody else up. Mm -hmm. And they seem to kind of say, how does this person fit into my agenda? In okay. a sense of what can I get out of this person? And then and that's that's an interaction of use, right? Rather than, you know, of using someone else rather than of you know, accepting them. You said, I mean, judging them, but I mean, the definition of prejudice is when you prejudge somebody before you know them. Mm -hmm. And since you're only looking at things externally, it's very easy to prejudge before you get to know them. Well, a lot of the definitions that we've been talking about have actually there's been a common denominator here, and that is much of it is external. So the definition that you guys gave actually applies in many cases to almost everything. 
that this is that this is about surfaces, um, and so there is a judgment to be made by the people in the story um, about someone's worthiness of dignity because of who they are. And if that changes, like Manly Pointer, you know, shifts his shifts the way he's going to talk in order to fulfill Mrs. Hopewell's um, definition of dignified, having inherent dignity, um, then that means that there, that there isn't anything inherent about it. It's just external. Yeah. Like when he, he comes up and he, he, he's already got his plan based on the name of the people, the right. Cedars, right? Mm -hmm. So he thinks it's Mrs. Cedar, he's got his game plan. And then he realizes he's wrong, and he says, well, Mrs. Hope, I hope you are well. He puns on the name, because now he realizes he's, he has to change his text. So he's, he's already doing that kind of chameleon thing, even mm -hmm. before he has that moment. And then he finagles his way into dinner. Right, right. Um, and he's, he is recognizing about these two these people that they, that they are only interested in what he appears to be, not what he actually is. So we started our discussion here about the nature of fallenness. And so fallenness? Fallenness. In other words, how, um, how fallen is human nature, for example? And so um, it seems to me, I, mean, I was arguing the point that it's all custom. It's all tradition. It's all external, in a sense. Mm -hmm. With what's going on, but not just obviously in this in this thing, but in life, I, I guess I'm talking about uh, I don't know, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, for example. Mm -hmm. and Alcoholics Anonymous, the alcoholic comes in and says, "I am powerless. Right? I am a master of nothing." So, in some sense or another, I don't have anything who's me who, who is inherent inherently to dignify. Mm -hmm. Everything I have comes from God, right? And so if I have dignity because I have this made the image of God, I guess, but but it doesn't give you anything in the world, right? Mm -hmm. You have to accept God as the center of your life and so on. And so the next day you have to go back to an alcoholics anonymous meeting, right? And in, in essence experience your dignity in this group of people who are all powerless. See? So anyway, in this story, it's hard to see any, from that vantage point, to see any inherent dignity in anybody. No, I think that's, I think that's right. And, and they're, they, are, they're, they are responding to a kind of powerlessness, aren't they? All, all of them are. Um, Joy Holga is actually, I mean, she, probably does not even think of herself as having some kind of inherent dignity. Um, manifested to a certain degree because she, you know, she's an atheist, she doesn't believe in anything, she doesn't believe, she doesn't believe in science, right? But she, she seeks out power over somebody else by do trying to dominate them. Um, and so she places her, her self-worth and her identity on her leg and in her intellectual pursuits. And when someone pulls those away from her, she has nothing. Right. Yeah. But the, the leg is both false and hollow. Right. right? So that's that's in a way a symbol of, of it. she she has very I, I think in kind of open rebellion to her mother, she she, she probably sees her mother's Christianity as Hollow and, and, and yes, false, she does. and she has rejected that. She's taken the name. She's looked for. A, she's looked for ugliness specifically in the name, right? She's looked. She she scowls. Even the the mother seems to say that you know she would she would have a pretty face. She didn't scowl all the time, and she's she seems to do, do most of what she does to have this power over the mother that the mother cannot force her to be a Christian along the lines of the mother's Christianity. But it's also important to remember that the mother's Christianity is also hollow. Right, yeah. So Joy Holga is right about her mother. Right. Her mother is right about her. 
um, there is you know, a sort of fundamental vacuum of dignified humanity here in all of these people whose, and Mrs. Hopewell's name, of course, then becomes ironic, right? She does not hope well, <laughs> as it were. Um, we haven't, in none of the examples that you, that you gave, we haven't really talked about the end of the story, which is where people, students particularly, get a little puzzled. Um, how about we apply some of these terms, some of these ideas about um, intellectual uh, hospitality, thinking flexibly, unthreatened engagement, communication, um, in this scene in the in the hayloft with the leg, it's it's a little disturbing. <laughs> Most students come into class and they say, "It didn't go the way I thought it was going to go." <laughs> almost all the almost all the people in the story say. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> Is there a way that we can talk about some of these terms with thinking about? that encounter between um, Joy, Olga, and Manly Pointer. I mean, in a way, it, it illustrates what's dangerous or um, what's threatening about intellectual hospitality. Because if she's built her identity around the, the emptiness of her mother's Christianity, and for her, unbelief has become a crutch that um, that supports her, you know, view of herself is better than encountering his own, uh, um, you know, point to his own like lack of belief and seeing that it doesn't make him any better. Mm -hmm. He takes that crutch away from her. Yeah. So in the opposite of the situation with her mother, she's she's um, confident in her mother's belief. Hollow, maybe, and so she has that against which to play. Right, and she can she can she can support herself mm -hmm. on the belief that because she doesn't because she's not Christian she's better, and then she meets him and he's not better, and and <laughs> and he robs her of that that false support. Yeah, like walks off with her leg. <laughs> and he does it better than she does. She, he, he's, a, he's a better non-Christian than she is. He's <laughs> more successful at it. More he's got a, a whole valise full of his trophies for you know, engaging in this. She may be a, just a better Christian. Hey, pardon? She may just be a Christian. She might be. Yeah, because uh, she essentially trusts in his simpleness. <laughs> and I, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, she trusts him. Of course, she as you say, she trusts in his simpleness. She trusts in his ability not to see her for who she is. And I think that you know it's not uncommon that people can uh, can make assumptions about what you think, and then build themselves up and support themselves as better based on those assumptions. So in a way, that illustrates you know her kind of looking down on him illustrates what motivates a lot of intellectual inhospitality mm -hmm. is a way of like me by projecting what I think you are onto you, lifting myself above you. And so in a sense, it's, it could be a kind of illustration of why people are resistant to intellectual hospitality. Um, There's a risk to that, right? And, and I think the, if we go back to the, you know, the terms you gave us at the beginning and we're talking about this idea of unthreatened engagement and really all of the characters in the story except Mandy Pointer are threatened yeah. or feel threatened constantly and so they they have no way of engaging with each other that doesn't have that hanging over them because they, they, they're they, they don't have a, a refuge where they can engage with things in an unthreatened way. Mm -hmm. They, which probably goes back again to the, there's, there's a lack of underpinning here. Right. Um, there's, there's a lack of belief, there's a lack of, it's, you know, there's hollowness again. Um, and so being challenged by somebody 
whoever that might be, and it might be the guy who comes to the door selling Bibles, it might be your own daughter, or it might be the, the, the next door neighbor, you are, if, you are, if you have no underpinning, then you cannot be challenged. And so, you know, you're always, you're always feeling like you're being, you're being attacked, or you can't engage someone else's ideas or thoughts um, in an unthreatened in an unthreatening kind of way. Um, and so you go on the offensive, which is what the characters in the story do. This is why I said, sorry, go ahead. This is why I said there's a way in which actually this story is the exact, shows us the exact opposite of what we're talking about in this, in this description um, of what we're trying to, to get students to think about. Um, obviously, these characters are characters and in some respects one-dimensional. But they, but they show us, in, in relief, what happens when we don't do what we're talking about here. When we don't have this habit of thinking flexibly. There isn't a single person in the story who thinks flexibly. No, I'll take that back. Manly Pointer probably thinks flexibly. But again, in, in, in a cunning kind of way, yes. Um, in a, in a, um, well, that's because he has no ideas of his own. Yeah. He says, you ain't so smart. I've been believing nothing since I was a kid. In other words, you just got it. You just got into nothingness. You know, relatively recently. <laughs> I've been a nihilist all my life. I'm way ahead of you. I know more than you do yeah. about nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not, he, I, don't think he's, I don't think he's engaged in a lot of deep thought on this issue. I don't mean that. But, um, but yeah, they, these are character, all characters who are demonstrating exactly what we don't want our students to do. Yeah. At the end, though, you do see Joy mm -hmm. um, become much more hostile in a real sense. In what way? Well, well, it's the paragraph where he's, um, it starts, she sat staring at him. There was nothing about her face or her round, freezing blue eyes that would indicate that this had moved her. But she felt as if her heart had stopped and left her mind to pump her blood. She decided that for the first time in her life, she was to face to face with real innocence. So there's a vulnerability there. This boy with, with an instinct that came from beyond wisdom had touched the truth about her. When after a minute, she said in a hoarse, high voice, all right, it was like surrendering, surrendering him surrendering to him completely. It was like losing her own life and finding it again miraculously in his. And those are words for a real gift to self, real transcending of yourself and entering to another person. Mm -hmm. so, so she does become truly hospitable. You might say she becomes the true Christian and then she's burned from it. So <laughs> the students could take the lesson from this. If you're intellectually hospitable, you will pay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could, <laughs> right? You could. I mean, you have. To, if you're gonna, if you're gonna offer somebody a place at your table, you're opening yourself to. Right. This. You have to emphasize vulnerability and hospitality go together. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, it has to do with empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Which is at the heart of this as well. None of these characters are empathetic with one another, and it is a moment. It's a perverse moment of empathy, but it's a moment of empathy. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think I, I I I've looked at that passage several times, and I I think that there may be a moment here where this is again still Holga Joy Holga misinterpreting him. Um, right, he yeah. speaks to her own self awareness. No, I don't own. doubt that she's wrong when she's doing this, but nonetheless, he has got her to surrender to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's again doing for her, doing with her what he did with her mother. Yeah. Um, and presumably hundreds of others. So, but she is able to um, buy into, mm -hmm. um, with with a certain amount of vulnerability, the the uh, the sale that he's making here at that particular moment, which she has not been able to do before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it's Mrs. Freeman who has the last word in this story. Mm -hmm. Her name's also ironic. Yeah. Again. <laughs> You know, th there are lots of ways in which you can talk about the names of the characters here as being representative and not representative and on. Um, 
And it is, remember, in, in, on the, in the um, hierarchy of importance, people important in the story, Mrs. Freeman is way down there at the bottom, right, with her two lovely daughters, um, in terms of Mrs. Hopewell's perceptions of things. Mrs. Hopewell has said, um, why that looks like that nice dull young man that tried to sell me a Bible yesterday. You know, he was so simple, but I guess the world would be better off if we were all that simple. <coughs> Mrs. Freeman's gaze drove forward and just touched him before he disappeared under the hill. Then she returned her attention to the evil-smelling onion shoot she was lifting from the ground. Some can't be that simple. I know I never could. she means by that. She's given the last word. I'm still sophisticated. <laughs> I still know more. I still, I'm, 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 I'm smarter than everybody else in the room. I don't know. Some can't be that simple. There's a lot of different ways you can read it. Yeah. Right? Some can't be that simple. Some can't be that simple. Some can't be that simple. Hmm. All of which suggests a slightly different meaning in what she's saying, right? I know I never could. I'm not as simple as I appear to be, or um, I, boy, I wish I could be that simple. Well, she's pulling an onion which has layers. <laughs> she, has <laughs> yeah, so she is pulling an onion. Evil, evil smelling. But it is an evil smelling, smelling. yes. <laughs> it is an evil smelling. Thoughts or my first read, when I, the first time I read it, I thought she saw through this whole thing all the whole time. She she knew Hopewell and Joy were the ones being played a fool uh -huh. by Manly Pointer, and I that's how I read it. And I try rereading a couple, but I still kind of come back to that first mm -hmm. initial reaction. Mm -hmm. I, I I kind of think so too. Um, I I think you could I think you could make an argument against that, but. Um, this is somebody who really sees people. Um, and it's a little hard to get to her because she's presented in such a comical way. You know, she's always talking about her daughter who keeps throwing up, you know. Um, your, you know, glycerin and caramel. Um, <laughs> but she also opens the story, right? She does, yeah. With the discussion of her looks and her gazes and what they mean. Mm -hmm. she, her gaze touched him before exactly. he disappeared over the horizon. Yes. She, she sees, sees him. Yes. She sees. And well, and the other thing, and going back to y'all's um, definition, when you were, and your word was tolerance, but the thing about recognizing, wasn't that, wasn't that yours? Mm -hmm. Everybody is different. Oh, no, it must have been. Who had tolerance? We had tolerance. We did. We did. But they had recognized a good trust of people and inviting them over for dinner. Yeah, maybe that's Until they hospitality. Whichever one it was. The thing I was thinking about is the word could have been wisdom mm -hmm. in terms of the story, right? Wisdom, acting wisely, mm -hmm. is recognizing other people for who they are, mm -hmm. who they are. And in a sense, Freeman is the wisest. I think so. Yeah. In, that, in that sense. Yeah. Because she, even more so than Manly Pointer, is reading everyone. Yes. She, Mrs. Freeman is also someone who, like everybody else in the story, thinks she's always right. But, right. Mm -hmm. but yes, I think she has slightly more insight into, into at least who he is mm -hmm. um, and can read him. She, of course, also is the one who gets Hulga. She's the one who keeps calling her Hulga, mm -hmm. right. making her mad. She knows it makes Hulga mad, and so she calls her that name. Um, which I, you know, I think is a kind of, it's her getting a little of her own back. You know. If you're going to act so superior around me, well, you want to be called Helga, I'll call you Helga. And you're not going to like it. Um, it's a very simple kind of understanding of other people that she seems to have. And maybe she talks about her daughters incessantly because uh, it's actually what Mrs. Um, What's her name preferred? What's it? Hope Hope prefers because then she knows her daughter from her faults is still superior to the Freeman daughters. <laughs> 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 up at 15 and 
you know. Yes, but you can define them. You can't That's say, true. my daughter is a philosopher. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? I think this is what Will's for. That's all I got. Anybody have any thoughts or questions or other ways in which you can see how to use the story? Well, so we go back to the, the um, habit of mind. We use the term entertaining ideas, mm -hmm. right? Which is a very hospitality word. And I think the enter is important because when you entertain somebody, you're holding them between two things, and that's what it means etymologically. So it's not like you're not holding them hostage, you're not detaining them, you're not retaining them, you're just entertaining them. So intellectual hospitality implies that you, you take this idea in for a while. You have to, you have to try it out unthreateningly, and you might. It, it, it doesn't mean. I think part of the threat, the threat that comes is. Oh my gosh! I may have to keep this idea, or somebody's going to know. Mm -hmm. Right? I think part of the evil of of um, Pointer is he steals things right from people's vulnerabilities. You're not, you you have to expose your vulnerability to the world to say that somebody stole my glass eye, mm -hmm. or that somebody somebody stole my 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 wooden leg. And um, I think that part of the threat that we feel is is, is the fear that. What are people going to say if I have this book on my shelf? Or what are these people going to say if, if I say I read this particular thing? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it's, it's important, even as f for the freshman right away, to say it's OK to try ideas on for size, because just, just to think about something doesn't necessarily mean to agree with it. And you're never going to know why you disagree with it if you don't make an effort to understand it. Because I, I, I see a lot of the freshmen coming in, and and they, they it, it's you can think about something being sinful without practicing it. Mm -hmm. It's not part of the sin to consider why it's wrong. For example, I mean, mm -hmm. or theology or, or an idea that's false. As a matter of fact, you you probably know better how to avoid it once you know what the nature of the evil is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and Joy, that is Joy Holga's problem, right? She, she, she does not entertain. She doesn't, she is, she has that right. kind of fear. Well, she's yeah. picked her ideas just because they pick, tick her mom off. Mm -hmm. It's not because, yeah. Yeah. But and maybe that's why she can't get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Even maybe. though Heidi was really popular, but she probably does. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> So the other thing, and, and this kind of came up in our conversation, but it, it, it's flipped further in terms of getting the students to think. So the whole idea of good country people is that it, it is exclusionary because if you're saying if they were good, if they were good people, you would say they're good people, not they're good country people. And so um, asking the perhaps asking the students to think about um, in what ways they put themselves into that group, right? That that in group versus other, you know, so, I mean, why would you say I'm a good Christian instead of I'm just a good person, right? Like, that, that's implying this designation that is separating you from these other people and not allowing their ideas in. Or, in, in other cases, where are you saying, oh, well, he's a good whatever, mm -hmm. but that's still beyond me, right? And, and is that, are there places where we could, we could break that down? Yeah, the story is about division, right. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and acting upon that division. To, to, to follow that up, I wonder whether we might even try some substitutions. You know, he's pretty good for a communist. He's pretty good for an atheist. You know, for, for a Christian, he's not too bad. Uh, the, the issue of, say, first comes the classification, and then once we have the identification, we'll be able to evaluate it just so we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's look down our noses upon each other. Yes, when I first read this, I thought, well, I don't want to be hospitable anymore. <laughs> this family got, you know, invaded by this guy. Um, anyway, um, so that was my first thought. But I also felt like it made Protestants and atheists look pretty bad. It does. Um, but it's also one that... Um, I, I, 
part of part of an approach to what O'Connor is doing here is is not that she's um, criticizing Protestants or atheists specifically. Um, they just are, happen to be the systems of belief that are in this particular text. Um, so yes, that can be that could be something that um, in a discussion of the story, you know, might come up that um, you know students would say, well, you know, there you go. Um, and I think that it's important to recognize that really what um, O'Connor is talking about is being a good Christian. And these are the people that she saw. These people that she that she these been in terms of in terms of the um, uh, the area of the country in which she lived. Um, this was a much more Protestant part of the country than Catholic, and so this is this. These are the examples that she's talking about. I don't think she's really. I don't think she's speaking specifically against Protestantism, but rather um, false Christianity. She's also just saying a little bit of living with her mother. Yeah. That was that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's all there's a lot of biographical stuff going on in this story that has to do with her herself. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.